Welcome to an online Bible study from Harborside Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join Pastor Arbuckle for this week's Bible study. Well, good evening, folks. It's good to see you all logging on with us this evening. Looks like we're going to get some more snow. Uh, that's a bad four-letter word from where I come from, but uh, this is Ohio, and it is February, and it is wintertime, so we're uh, going to be ready for that, I suppose. But I want you to turn in your Bibles to James chapter 5 as we continue our study. And we'll be finishing it up here probably uh, within the, well, by the end of February, I'll say that. Uh, we may be done by uh, next week, perhaps. Um, I may go one more study further, uh, just depends. But uh, we'll be finishing up our study on fearlessly facing the future. I hope it has been a, a blessing to you and a help to you. I hope that you've uh, taken some notes, perhaps just some things that will help you to um, <clears throat> fearlessly face the future and understand what the Bible says about how we should go about doing that and what kind of attitudes we should have when we face perilous times. You remember Paul told Timothy that this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. We're in them. Those are difficult times. Those are hard to bear, hard to deal with times. And uh, we've been learning a lot. I know I have. And uh, it seems that every lesson, really, the Lord has just um, made it so that uh, during the week after I, I give it to you and teach uh, online, uh, something happens in our lives personally, uh, my life personally, to um, put those things into practice. And I hope it's been a help to you. Um, James chapter 5, uh, we'll get into this here in just a second, but when perilous times come uh, and, and persist and life seems to get worse, maybe you've uh, encountered that here even while we were going through our study, it's really easy to lose heart, isn't it? Uh, you look around and you see, you know, things that are going on, especially with the pandemic and uh, the restrictions and, and the closings and different things like that. Uh, and maybe in your life where, you know, one thing started and now you've got four five, six different things. My mom used to say, um, it's not, if it's not one thing, it's 10. And sometimes that, that feels like, you know, every time you turn around, something's going wrong. And it's easy for us when that seems to happen to lose heart and take a fatalistic view of our future. Okay, it's never going to get any better. It's always going to be this bad. Uh, and so on. And eventually, you know, all I'll do, uh, all I can do is hope to endure and uh, hopefully, you know, die in my sleep or something like that. Or maybe the Lord will come back, but who knows and so forth. And sometimes we can get that way. But in this letter that James has written to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, as you read uh, through the book of James, you find out the um, group of people that he's talking to in the first chapter in the first verse, uh, he gives several exhortations that will help us as it helped them stay committed. And that's what our lesson is going to be about. We have been following um, our lessons and, and uh, given the, the headings all with C's. Remember, stay calm, stay compassionate, stay conscientious, stay connected, and so forth. Stay centered and whatnot. We're going to look at what it means to be to be committed, to stay committed uh, to faithfully enduring those trials as we look for the return of the Lord. Uh, James chapter 5, let me start reading in verse number 7. I'll read down through verse 11, and then I'll have a word of prayer. But James 5, 7 says, be patient. There's the idea we're going to look at this evening. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman or the farmer, uh, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience, there's that idea again, for it, until he receiveth the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful or full of pity. 
and of tender mercy. Those particular verses that uh, talk about patience, we're going to kind of look at several of them, and I hope you'll stay up with us. We will turn a few pa- a few other places as we look at uh, what it means to stay committed when perilous times come, those hard to bear, hard to deal with times, those difficult times, or as James says, be patient. But let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into our study. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to look into your word now. And we thank you for this study. We thank you uh, for the fact that uh, the material has just been exactly what we needed. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the truths in your word that are just as applicable today in the 21st century as they were in the first century. And we pray that you would help us to continue to resort to them and look at them and feast upon them and get them ingrained in our lives. So when we face perilous times, difficult, hard to deal with, hard to bear times, that we respond properly, that we respond as Jesus did, to be calm and to be compassionate, to be centered and committed now, Lord, uh, patient, focused is what it means. And we pray that you would help us uh, in these last days to look for opportunities to point people to the Lord. Because James, in this passage that we read, talks about the coming of the Lord. You know when that's going to happen. It could happen before the lesson is over this evening. It could come before the sunrise tomorrow. And Father, we pray that you would help us uh, in the meantime to stay faithful. It could come uh, sometime in our lifetime. It could come 100 years from now. And Lord, whatever time that is, we pray that you would help us to use it wisely Help us to point others to Christ before it's eternally too late. We pray your blessings upon every family that is represented with us this evening. We pray for those that might be logging on even now. And Lord, we pray, especially as we will be bringing some prayer requests to you here in just a little bit, that you would superintend in a mighty way in every circumstance, be especially near to these folks that we'll mention. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well. If you counted the number of times that James mentions the word patient uh, or patience, he he mentions it five times in these verses, these uh, very few verses, verses 7 to 11 in James chapter 5. And I want us to uh, to understand what that means, patient about what? Well, to begin with, we should be patient or committed to uh, the process. Notice verse number 7 again. He says, be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman or the farmer waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receiveth the early and latter rain. Now, James goes into a farming illustration here, which is pretty obvious. But if you've ever grown a garden or or maybe just, um, oh, I don't know, tried to grow some tomato plants off your porch or something like that. Uh, you know that there's a lot more to uh, just putting uh, or growing and and having a garden and and having produce and so on. You can imagine a farm uh, where there are lots of crops and and lots of acreage and so on. Uh, There's a lot to uh, doing that more and and it's more than just uh, going out and just throwing seed on the ground. Uh, One of my uh, evangelist friends, when he was a uh, a teenager, he got this really good idea. He might, well, he might have been in, um, oh, I don't know, junior high school, something like that, seventh, eighth grade, early teen years, and he wanted a summer job. Well, he was too young to get a summer job with some of the companies in his area, so uh, he got this wild idea. He went and got a bunch of watermelon seeds, and uh, he scratched a, an area in his in their backyard and uh, just tore up the ground and threw these watermelon seeds out there and uh, didn't realize that every seed develops a vine which may have more than one watermelon or maybe several watermelons on it. And uh, over the course of the summer, he had more watermelons than he knew what to do with. Uh, and But he went out, he threw these watermelon seeds on the ground, went to bed, you know, he sprinkled some water on them, 
and so on and went to bed and woke up the next morning. And guess what? He didn't have watermelons. And he was, he was, he was sure that the gentleman at the hardware store had, had sold him some defective watermelon seeds. Well, you know, uh, if you've ever tried to plant anything, you know, if you've ever been uh, in elementary school and even uh, junior high or high school uh, science class, you know, when you, did you ever uh, take one of those lima beans and put it in a little Dixie cup with some potting soil and a little bit of water and see what happens? Yeah, you know what happens. It eventually grows, but it takes time, doesn't it? And the idea here, again, is the, this farming idea, when it comes to being patient and dealing with trials, okay, trials are going to come. So how do we handle them? Well, we got to be patient. We have to be patient. And there's a lot of, a lot of things that have to be, to, to be done to raise a crop, right? It's not just throwing seeds out there and all of a sudden, boom, there it is, right? No, there's tilling the ground and maybe you have to fertilize and maybe it is that you have to, um, you know, after the seeds start to germinate and so on uh, and they start coming up, you have to keep the critters out of them and, and then you have to keep the bugs off of them and you have to get rid of the, the, uh, the weeds and stuff like that. And there's a lot of things that need to be done uh, while the, the um, plants are growing, while the harvest is on its way. And the same is true when it comes to us, when it comes to dealing with, with uh, trials in these perilous times that we live in, we need to make sure that we are constantly improving, okay? That we're staying calm, staying, staying compassionate and staying centered and staying connected and now staying committed, being patient, enduring, all right, these things will, will come. But notice what he says there. He says that the, the husbandmen have long patience, okay, for it. What is he talking about? He's talking about the harvest. He's talking about that precious fruit of the earth, okay? And the, the phrase long patience there means to endure patiently without despondency. Now, that's an interesting word, despondency. To be despondent means to be extremely discouraged. Have you ever been extremely discouraged before? Have you ever been extremely dejected? Maybe it was that things, I don't know what it would be. You're trying, you have a goal in mind and you're trying to pursue your goal and you're trying to get there. And um, for whatever reason, maybe there's a test involved. I can remember when I was a student at Bob Jones University, every student had to take two semesters of history of civilization. That was just standard. Everybody has to take it. And to this day, if I, if I uh, am correct, every student at Bob Jones University still has to take two semesters of history of civilization, okay? And it is, I'm telling you what, it is one of the, now I like history, but it is one of the most boring classes that I have ever had to, to, to sit through, except for perhaps the philosophy of education class. And that one was a snoozer for sure. But you have to go through that regardless. But when I was going through it, I thought I was a pretty decent student by that time. I mean, I'd already been to three state schools uh, so I thought I had this, um, you know, academic thing uh, down pretty well, but I just could not retain the material for whatever reason. And I went to one of my roommates who was a straight A student and I said, hey, look, you've had this class. How'd you do? Well, I didn't really need to ask because he got an A. He got an A and everything. And uh, he said, well, you're, you're going about it all wrong. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're studying, you're going about it all wrong. You're, you're not studying properly. And he taught me how to study. And I brought my grade up so that I eventually passed the class. But I'll tell you what, there was a time when I was really, really discouraged with the whole thing. I was just dejected. I don't know that I was depressed, but sometimes when difficult times come, what happens? We don't have that long patience, do we? We don't have, because we live in an instant society, right? I mean, there's instant coffee. Okay, I'm not so much into instant coffee anymore, okay, but I used to be. 
There's instant coffee, instant potatoes, um, instant oatmeal, instant grits, okay? Instant everything. We go down to the store and we call we we just call it the store. We maybe we call it the Parmar right down here from where we live. Uh, but what is it? What kind of store is it? It's a convenience store, right? One of the reasons why Walmart is in existence and stores like it is because people can get their clothing, they can get their their prescriptions, they can get um, their food. They can get there, and while they're waiting and doing that, they can get their car taken care of. It's all one spot, right? It's very convenient, all right? Now, a lot of times when we have difficult times, when we have perilous times, hard to deal with, hard to bear times, things that come and they test us, okay? What do we want uh, to happen? We want those things to go away just like that. We don't wanna have to endure these things, okay? We want instant gratification. We want instant answers to prayer. We want instant miracles. We want instant everything. We want to instantly know what God's got planned for the future. And when it doesn't happen the way we think it should on our timetable, we get discouraged. And we miss the exhortation here to stay committed, all right? Think about how committed the farmer has to be to his future. He gets up early, he stays up late, and he works, and he gets calluses, and he gets dirt under his fingernails, and he, you know, he bangs his knuckles on the tractor as he as he's he's fixing them, and he maybe, you know, he cuts himself on a barbed wire and, and then he's fixing fence and different things. And all of those things that go into it, he has to be committed to do that. Well, we have to be committed ourselves to be the kind of Christians that we ought to be, especially in difficult and perilous times. But too often, what do we do? We don't have the patience for it, right? Now, I will admit, I come from a long line of impatient people. So God's still working on me. I'm learning, okay? But so you understand, undoubtedly, that we need to be patient, we need to be committed to the process, okay? God is still working in our circumstances, in the lives of those that we love. He's still working in our country. He's still working in this world. He's not done with us yet. Sometimes difficulty comes. Sometimes there, there are tests that the Lord brings in our lives. Sometimes it's, you know, through no fault of our own, we find ourselves in a difficult spot. So what do we do? We stay committed. We stay patient to, for the process. We also need to patiently expect a product, okay? Now, notice verse number seven again in James chapter five says again, be patient, therefore, endure, be committed. That's the idea. Brethren, under the coming of the Lord, one of these days, Jesus is going to come, okay? So in the meantime, all of the stuff that comes, you need to endure, you need to be committed. You need to be patient to go through it, okay? Behold, the husbandman, the farmer, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, okay? And hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. What is this, the, the precious fruit of testing? What is it? Is there a, is, is there a benefit? to successfully coming through perilous times, difficult times, bearing under those burdens, bearing under those difficult to deal with, hard to deal with, hard to bear times. Is there a benefit? What is it? Well, let's hold your finger in James and turn to, and maybe if, you, if your, your Bible's printed like mine, you, all you have to do is pay, turn one page over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 6. Peter says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Okay? Have you been through some difficulty that's kind of hard to bear? Heavy? You know how that is. When you're bearing a burden, you ever come across? 
in, in contact with somebody who is, I mean, you can just look at them sometimes and you say, what's wrong? And they'll be nice, you know, and they'll, they'll, they maybe they'll lie to you. Not when they don't want to burden you with the burden that they're burdened with and so on. And, and um, they'll say nothing. I'm fine. No, come on. I can tell by looking at you that things are not fine. What's going on? Well, this happened. And maybe it's not them. Okay. Maybe it's a loved one. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a grandchild. Maybe it's, it's a friend or something like that. But that manifold temptation, that hard to deal with thing, notice what it says. He says there, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now notice, here's part of the reason why we go through things, why we go through difficulty. There's a product to it. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What are we talking about? What is the product, the precious fruit that can be produced through testing during perilous times that we deal with? Well, it could very well be God's honor. Are you aware of the fact that God gets the honor and the glory every time one of his children passes one of these tests? And it's interesting to me that a lot of times when you're talking to people, I was talking to a gentleman uh, just recently, and, and uh, I'm, um, I'm really hoping he's going to get saved. I really am. I need to, to schedule some time when I can have some time with him uh, just to continue our friendship, but uh, ask him some, some difficult questions, some hard questions, some important questions about his salvation, because I know he's not saved. But are you aware of the fact that people watch you? People, people know if you're a Christian or not. I was telling him, we, we, we were talking the other day, uh, just a couple days ago, as a matter of fact, and, and uh, I was telling him, I said, yeah, I said, I know he was talking about some of his uh, wilder days and so on. If you've ever known anybody that had one of those. And I said, yeah, I said, well, uh, I said, I've uh, been there, done that. And he said, what? He said, I find that hard to believe. He said such a, I mean, here we have such an upstanding, outstanding, uh, you know, fellow with impeccable character and so on and so forth. And I, I had a hard time getting out of the store because my head swelled up because of his accolades and all of that, that he was throwing on me and whatnot. Um, I said, no, man. I said, there's some things that, that I know about me that nobody knows about me except God. Some things that I would be ashamed if you knew what that is. And that's the truth. But you know what? He says right here, honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. People watch you. And they watch you when you're going through difficulty. And they want to see, is there really something to this Christianity? Is there really something to the Bible? Is there really something to, is there something besides just this that we're living, these difficult times? And when you come through that for God's honor and God's glory, and you respond properly the way you're supposed to, notice what he says here, that we should rejoice, though if need be for a season right now, we're going through some difficulty. And when we respond properly to trials and tribulations and testings and difficulties and problems, perilous times, God gets the glory. It's God's honors that is at stake, beloved. And my question to you is this. Do you want God to get the honor for how you handled the difficulty? I know I do. I'm sure you do as well. But that's one of the precious fruits that he's talking about there in James. How about this? Hold your finger in James and turn to Romans chapter 5. Turn to Romans chapter 5. 
Hold your finger in James 5 and go to Romans chapter 5. And notice another precious fruit that is produced through difficulty. That if we stay committed, we stay patient in spite of the problem to stay true to the Lord. Notice verse number three of Romans chapter five. And he says, By, uh, and not only so, but we, okay, here it is. This is, this is tough. We glory in tribulation also. Knowing that tribulation worketh, here's the word again, patience, endurance, commitment, okay? And patience, experience, okay? And experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So what is the precious fruit there? The precious fruit that is produced through difficulty, through perilous times, if we, if we handle them properly, if we're committed to do what God wants us to do, the way God wants us to do it, and we respond to all the problems the way God expects us to, guess what? Hope comes. How many times have you taken a test? Maybe you did real well. And the next test rolled around. And it's a little bit easier. Hope is that confident expectation. It's not, a, well, I hope it's not going to snow anymore. Yeah, it's snowing like crazy right now, here at our house anyway. I don't know what, what they're calling for, but um, I got my snowblower. Thank you, Harborside Baptist Church. I got my snowblower all primed and ready. Um because I figure we're going to need it here in the next couple of days. But hope is not, well, I hope it doesn't rain on our parade. I hope, you know, some uh, something great happens. I hope whatever it is, something that is not, not sure. Hope in the Bible, scriptural hope, biblical hope, what Paul is talking about, which tribulation brings patience and pray, patience brings ultimately hope, okay? is that confident expectation that God will do what he said in his perfect timing. Now, that's part of the kicker, isn't it? That's part of the problem, isn't it? We know that God's going to work these things out, Romans 8, 28, right, for good, okay? But when do we want it? We wanted it yesterday, right? We, want it. we don't want to have to go through any more than we've already been through. And we lack the endurance. We lack the patience. We lack the commitment to stay centered and connected to the Lord in trial. And when things go bad and we bail out because it got difficult, what does the unsaved world see? They see a bunch of cowardly Christians who are not committed to anything as long as there's sunshine and lollipops and lemonade. When the clouds roll in and the thunder rolls and the lightning crashes and the waves beat high and overflow the boat, what do we want to do? We want to bail out. God doesn't get the honor for that. That doesn't, that doesn't engender hope in us. Hey, we passed that test before. This one's not going to be any, different, any different, any more difficult, because guess what? The same God that helped us pass the test last time is still alive. He's still on the throne. He's still sovereign. He's still capable, and he's still going to bring us through it. But we have to be committed to that. We have to have that patience. We have to have that endurance. Because there is going to be a product. There's going to be a product. We also need to, in the meantime, empower. If you go back to James chapter 5, look at verse number 8. 
He says, be ye also patient, okay, as the farmer committed to the process, the product is coming, do what you're supposed to do, take care of the weeds in your heart, take care to make sure that, um, you, you know, you're staying compassionate and, and, and calm, looking for opportunities to serve the Lord and, and to um, be constructive to edify one another, build somebody up in the faith, be an encouragement to somebody, point them to Christ. Tell them if you're going through, if they're going through the same thing that you did before, some time ago, and God brought you through it, say, hey, look, I know exactly how you feel. And they'll say, well, you can't know. Yes, yes, I do. I've been there and I've done that. And here's what God did. And I know that he can help you through it too. But what we do is we, he says here, verse number eight, be ye, pace, be ye also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The word establish there means to let your purposes and faith be firm and unwavering, okay? The idea is to check the load-bearing pillars of your faith. Is your, what kind of faith do you have, by the way? Do you have a strong, rock, solid faith? Like the man in the, uh, the Gospels that Jesus talked about, he that heareth my word and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. Now, the foolish man heard the same thing, but he didn't do what Jesus said. And his his house was built on the sand, and we know what happened to that house, right? Where's your faith based? Is your faith based on a doctor or the government or yourself or something else? Or is it based on the solid bedrock truths of Scripture that tell us about the God of the universe who is capable of doing whatever it is in his good pleasure to do. Where's your faith? He says, in a manner of speaking, to empower your heart. Don't allow faith in God to weaken for any reason. You might hear somebody say, oh, well, you know what's going to happen government and whatever it is restrictions so on so forth all things going on in the world it's yeah it is going to get worse i understand that but i've also read the end of the story and guess who wins we do and until that time we have opportunities to point others to christ but if i'm not strengthening my heart What's going to happen the next time I come under a load, a hard-to-bear circumstance, whatever it might be? What's going to happen? My faith is going to crumble. I'm, I'm going to be a terrible testimony. And folks, you got to understand something. I've been there. I've done that. And I'm ashamed to tell you. I'm not going to get into the details because I don't want any of you to know. But there have been a lot of times in my life when I was, people look at me and they say, there's no way in the world that guy could be a Christian because he just did that. But you know what? I'm glad that God is merciful. I'm glad that he's forgiving. And I'm also glad that when we, when we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that helps me when I'm faced with turmoil and temptation and so on to say, no, I can handle that. I've done it before. Not that you take pride in yourself. No. But what you have to do is you have to check your faith. What's your faith, your faith based on? If it's based on the eternal, omnipotent, all-powerful God of the universe you, you've got a rock-solid faith. Nothing is going to damage it. Nothing is going to destroy it. Nothing is going to dent the thing, right? But you've got to be checking up. You've got to establish 
your hearts. The wording of it basically means establish your own hearts yourself. You have to do that. But you patiently empower your heart. And one way you do that is to get into the word of God. One way you do that is to stay connected, whether it be verbally or virtually or in person, right? So you do that. You empower your heart. You stay committed to that. Lastly, if you want to turn over to James chapter 1, what do you do? Ultimately, you, you faithfully and patiently, in a committed way, respond as we should. Look at verse number one of James number one of James chapter one. Okay. I mentioned to you this in, in the opening uh, that James was talking to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. He says here, James one, one, he says, James, the servant of God and of the, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad. Why were the 12 tribes scattered abroad? One word persecution persecution in the first century okay do you think that's a difficult thing is that a perilous time absolutely it is is it hard to bear yes it is is it hard to deal with at most definitely right but what did they do what is he telling them he says my brethren here's the response count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations when you fall into different kinds of tests okay the idea of count it all joy is to regard it. Now, this is an interesting thought, okay? I don't know that I've ever done this before. I'm going to try. I don't know that I've ever heard anybody that's ever done this before. But the, the phrase count it all joy means to regard it as a thing that will bring happiness. What? Are you aware of the fact that if you respond properly to difficulty, happiness comes from it? And you say, well, who's going to be happy? Well, God will be, okay? You think about this. How many times have you ever seen your children do the right thing or say the right thing or what, act the right way, whatever it is. Maybe you heard from one of their teachers and said, well, I'm so glad your kid is in my class. I'll tell you what, let me just tell you what happened and how they did and, and the circumstances and all that. Man, you must really be proud of them. Anytime that's ever happened in my life and probably in your life, you think you look at it and you say, yep, that's my kid. Absolutely. Woo wow. And when they come home or you see it or whatever it is, you just, I mean, it just brings you to tears because you're so joyful. You're so happy. You're so happy that they did the right thing. They said the right thing. They responded in the way that you would hope they did. It does the same thing to God's heart when his children respond the way they ought to. Count it all joy, knowing this, verse number three, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The trial was worth it. Why is that? Because it produced the endurance that I needed. I mean, you think about this. If you've ever been uh, in, on a sports team or something like that, I can remember I played high school uh, one just one year because I was, man, I just hated the running. But our coach told us, he said, we may get outscored, but I will tell you what, we will never get outrun. And he made us, we would run there sometimes when we'd run five or six miles in a practice. And we could, we could outrun, we could stay with anybody, any of the teams that we played. But I'll tell you what, going through the process, those of you that know, those of you that have ever been on a football team or any kind of team that does, you know, weight work and stuff like that, okay? Uh, I know Jonathan has told me before when he was playing football and so on, they would, you know, they, they'd work and they would literally go over to the sideline and throw up. 
and it kind of be it, it became a kind of a rite of passage. You know, you weren't working hard enough unless you threw up. But what is that? What is what does that build in you? Well, it builds endurance, doesn't it? And the same thing is true when the difficulty comes, the trying of your faith, the testing of your faith. How strong is your faith? The more you go through tests properly, you successfully complete them and go on to the next thing. What does that build? It builds that patience, that endurance, that commitment that not only brings happiness to should our heart, but also God's, but he goes on and he says, but let patience have a perfect way. There's a plan. You got to understand that. God has a plan for the problems, for the difficulty, for the perilous times. There's a plan, okay? When it comes to his children, what is the plan? The plan is that we learn some things. I was reading just this morning uh, in the material that I'm using for the lessons. Uh, and the question was, why is it that we keep, you know, people seem to go through so many problems and so many trials and so on? And the answer that the author gave was because maybe we're not learning. We're not, we're just not getting it. We're not responding the way we should. So what do we have to do? Have to go back over it again, right? How many of you, how many of us have ever had to retake a test or repeat a class? How many of us have had to, uh, when we go and we take our learner's permit and so on, and we go down to the DMV to um, get the, you, you know, get the test and get the license and everything, and we go back in there with a, a failing grade. How many of us have ever had to do that again? I know I did at least when it came to driving anyway, there have been some classes that I had to repeat too. Some tests that I had to retake, absolutely. Because I didn't respond properly. I wasn't ready. Same thing is true when it comes to trials of our faith, tests of our faith. Things that will test your commitment, your patience, your endurance. You're either gonna pass it or you're gonna repeat it. And maybe it is that we're not, the reason we're having to repeat so many things and things are so difficult for us sometimes is because we're not passing the test the way we ought to. Something that we need to think about. But he says in verse number four there, but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Basically what he's talking about is your character being fully developed. What kind of character do you want people well, what kind of character do you want to be known as having? Do you want to be known as having flaws in your character? Or do you want to be known as having the kind of characters pleasing to the Lord? People know when they look at you because they've seen you go through trials and you responded properly and you handled it for God's honor and God's glory and you were strengthened because of it, your faith became rock solid, and they look at you and they know that guy, that gal, that person, that's a Christian. Many of you probably heard my grandfather's mm -hmm. testimony. Um, my grandfather was led to the Lord by my grandmother. My grandfather, before he got saved, was about as wild as you could get. He was known for, for drinking and fighting. He came into their home years ago. My grandmother was sitting at their kitchen table. And he got down on his knees and he said to her, and they called each other mother and daddy. He said, mother. He said, I don't know what it is you have, but I know I don't have it in my life, and I need it, and I want it. And my grandfather got saved. My grandmother led him to the Lord in their kitchen. 
One of the reasons that happened was because my grandmother, who was saved as a child, had the kind of character that my grandfather saw that he needed. She had that hope, she had that sweetness, that peace, that endurance in her soul, in her spirit, because of her commitment to the Lord. That's what I want. I want people to see and to know that I belong to the Lord. And I hope I will have the kind of character, the kind of endurance, the kind of patience that James talks about. When trial comes, that people will see and people will know there is a Christian. And it's only going to happen, folks, if I'm committed to that, if you're committed to that, if you stay patient, if you endure, and if you respond to difficulty properly. You look at them as an opportunity to see God do something great. My life's verse, as many of you heard me say, is Jeremiah 33, 3. God comes to Jeremiah when he's in prison, and he says, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. That's what I want to see. In spite of the difficulty, in spite of the prayerless times, and the difficulties, and the hard, hard to bear, hard to, hard to deal with times, I want to see God do great things. I want to see him get the honor and the glory from my life and your life and the life of my family and the life of Harborside Baptist Church. And what does it take? It's going to take commitment. God's going to do his part. He always does. But it takes our part, too, to stay patient, to stay committed. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to look into your word. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to, to be committed, to follow you, to respond properly to the trials that come our way, to handle the perilous times the way we should, to rejoice in the face of adversity, to trust you, Lord, to work in our hearts, to strengthen our faith, and to overcome as we know you will. We pray your blessings now in Jesus' name. Amen.